infrastructure. Sorry, there was this recording interruption. So uh, this event is co-hosted by the Sustainable Infrastructure Partnership, uh, which is an initiative of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. And um, they will be represented by uh, Mrs. Anna Fernandez Vergara. Um, the overall context um, is a UNEP UPU collaboration for guiding the engagement between postal entities and climate policy communities. Ultimately, this work contributes to the implementation of UPU Congress Resolution C7 2023, enhancing the climate action of the postal sector through a UPU climate facility. This work has been developed bearing in mind two UN Environment Assembly resolutions on sustainable infrastructure. One output of this uh, UNEP-UPU collaboration is a joint report that covers efforts towards screening postal networks and examines how these networks can serve as multipurpose infrastructure for the provision of sustainability-related services. The event uh, will start very soon with a presentation uh, by Mrs. Fernandez Vergara on initial findings of the report, and then it will be followed by two guest speakers. The first one will be Mr. Jarod Ho, Head of Sustainability of Post Malaysia, and he will present Greening First and Last Mile Delivery Infrastructure in Malaysia. Uh, the third speaker will then be uh, Mrs. Margot Maiding, by Maidinger, uh, Head of European CSR Affairs from La Poste France. And she will present infrastructure for circularity in the French postal sector. The two presentations are based on case studies uh, that are in the process of publication in the Global Good Practices Database of Sustainable Infrastructure of the UNEP. Now, without further ado, Anna, the floor is yours. Please let us have your presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know as soon as you see yep. it. Yeah. We can see. Yep. Okay, perfect. And let me just put it on slideshow. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you again, Olivier, and hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you uh, for this presentation on how to establish postal networks as sustainable infrastructure. So we all know how climate change is one of the most important global crises that we will face in the next few decades and how it has a, what will have a profound impact on ecosystems, human health, food security, and global economy. Now, something that you might not have heard that often is how infrastructure is a key contributor to climate change, but also a driving force in a positive way. So uh, let me start with the negative. So infrastructure can be accountable for approximately 79% of global CO2 emissions. Sorry, primarily. Anna. And the slides is not advancing. Oh, uh, to me, it looks like it has moved. Are you looking at the cover first slide? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the slides has been frozen. Can you try to share it again? Otherwise, uh, I can do it. I can try to do it on my end. Okay, yeah, I'll try once more. Okay, can you see it now? No. Yes. yes. Is it moving? Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Sorry okay. for the interruption. Thanks. No, no. Thank you for letting me know. Um, okay, so uh, infrastructure can be uh, a negative uh, force, let's say, for climate change. Uh, it has been calculated that infrastructure uh, is accountable for approximately 79% of global CO2 emissions, uh, especially for buildings, energy, and transportation systems. But the story is not all negative because infrastructure can also be a positive force. It can influence the achievement of up to 92% of sustainable, sustainable development goals. Um, and so how can we make sure 
that we stay on the positive side? How can we ensure that infrastructure can actually be uh, this driving force for sustainable development goals? Well, first of all, it is important to note that in a way, this is already happening at the national scale. Since we don't have a lot of time, and maybe you're already familiar with global climate frameworks, uh, I would just like to refresh your memories by saying that together in nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans represent a country's strategy for climate action, both for mitigation and adaptation. And they are both giving special consideration to infrastructure sectors. So what you see now in the screen is how nationally determined contributions are uh, being considered um, infrastructure as part of their mitigation strategies. Now, this can take a variety of forms. So it can focus on renewable energy or perhaps on building codes, the expansion of public transit, uh, pu public transportation systems through electric vehicles. So there are a lot of uh, different um, initiatives, objectives that nationally determined contributions are targeting infrastructure sectors. So if we look at some figures, it has been estimated that around 80% of nationally determined contributions mention buildings, while 98% uh, mention uh, transportation systems. So we can see here how they are very importantly uh, considered in these national policies. Uh, just to add a few national examples, uh, Suriname, for example, um, prioritizing, is prioritizing greening the transport of networks to reduce urban emissions, uh, while Kenya is targeting climate resilience of its infrastructure. So, for example, for roads, they are trying to minimize flooding, and so they are um, advocating for vulnerability assessments and adopting sustainable uh, materials to bolster the resilience of their roads so that they can avoid climate risks further down the line. Uh, new Zealand is also considering how to ensure that all new assets uh, consider the long-term climate impacts. Now, all of these are examples to illustrate how governments are basically pushing for the different sectors of infrastructure to be this driver leading to green transitions rather than contributing to the environmental degradation. So if we are already witnessing how these national policies and strategies are considering infrastructure, then you might be wondering, is that enough? Uh, we are all good here, so why are we discussing this? Well, let me say that it is not enough because certain existing infrastructure systems are not being integrated into those national strategies, which both constitutes a missed opportunity, but also it limits the reach of those um, strategies at the national level. And one of those infrastructure systems that is not currently integrated is postal networks. So um, before moving forward, bef uh, let me clarify, why UNEP advocates for leveraging existing infrastructure systems instead of just developing new assets. So infrastructure demand is expected to grow because population levels will grow, but the answer cannot always be to just build new infrastructure. Um, this contributes to resource depletion since building new infrastructure requires large amounts of materials and energy. So if existing infrastructure systems already exist, it is better to upgrade them, retrofit them, or repurpose those systems instead of building new ones. And uh, this is what led us to the report that Oliver has already mentioned, in which we are arguing that postal networks can actually help close that gap. We know that postal networks have uh, extensive global reach and also uh, it's a very unique position within communities. Uh, it is viewed as a trusted partner and with its universal mandate of postal services, it allows for solutions to be implemented at remote locations and ensures an inclusiveness level that it's basically on parallel with other sectors. Um, we have also identified 
a huge opportunity for, for influencing consumer behavior because of its uh, role in logistics value chain and also in collecting critical data on environmental issues, but also, for example, on plastic packaging, uh, consumption levels. So we can see here why it's so important and why the potential is there. Now that we have established the why, then we can now move to exploring its feasibility. From a technical perspective, can we say that postal networks are or could be sustainable infrastructure? Well, we want to start with a common understanding of infrastructure in one particular way. Infrastructure systems are the backbone of every society because they provide essential services that could be, they go from energy, water, all the way to telecommunications. And this is very important because we will see how postal networks are providing some of the, those essential services. Um, and so it adds to narrative of why they should be considered infrastructure systems and then sustainable infrastructure. Now, if we um, look at postal networks through the infrastructure lens, we should start first by clarifying that when we discuss sustainable infrastructure, it is not about individual posts to serve as infrastructure in the national context, but rather the whole sector. That's why we use a postal network as a term. Then um, it has all the components of other infrastructure systems. For example, on hard infrastructure assets, we have uh, postal offices, sorting centers, distribution centers, or even uh, lockers. Uh, while we look at the soft infrastructure, then we find human personnel that are running all the operations, including mail carriers, but also employees at postal offices, the local communities, then customers, the underlying digital systems, also policies and knowledge. So um, all of these components basically paint a, pic a picture of why we consider postal networks as infrastructure systems. Now, the next question is how can we actually evaluate whether postal networks can be leveraged as sustainable infrastructure? And in this report, we are taking two methods to evaluate this um, assessment, this proposition. The first one is in analyzing the greenness of the infrastructure system supporting those postal operations. Now here in the slide, we see two different levels. At the global le the level and sectoral level, let's say, we know that you've already established a very ambitious goal of reducing CO2 emissions by 85% by 2015. And then you also have these ambitious plans to create a UPU climate facility. And also uh, you have developed very good tools such as the OSCAR tool to calculate emissions and to identify some reduction opportunities, uh, monitor progress. Uh, and, and this is at the global level, very useful frameworks to actually prioritize sustainable infrastructure in a way. Then if we look at the national level, we have also found very strong evidence about how these practices are becoming more and more common among designated operators. So I will not go uh, too much into detail because we are uh, very privileged to have someone from Post Malaysia and La Post France to actually explain a little bit better on some of these initiatives at the national level. But let's say that we have found um, very good examples on electrifying the postal fleets, green buildings, and also on the promotion of circular economy. So that was the first, uh, the first method that we're using. And we see how this is already painting a picture of how postal networks can be seen as sustainable infrastructure because they are greening their own operations. Now, if you look at the second element, um, we see that how postal networks are offering different types of services. This means that they are giving multiple purposes to their infrastructure. And so this is, uh, as I said before, uh, this is resource efficiency in its most basic uh, core element. 
Why? Because then there is no need to build new infrastructure, but rather we use the infrastructure systems that already exist and we provide new services, such as uh, how the postal networks have already done so. So um, modern postal services now offer a wide variety of services that go far beyond traditional mail delivery functions. Um, we can see on financial services that they offer postal saving systems and electronic funds transfers, but also uh, on social services, they deliver vaccines, they visit elderly, they collect donations for vulnerable groups, uh, they enable voting uh, through posts, um, they offer public access to internet. So there's a wide variety uh, of services that they are providing. And if you have not done so, I would encourage you to read the the UPU report that was re, uh, prepared a couple of years ago on social services. Um, then we also found, because we are focusing on climate action today, uh, some strong evidence of the same trend, but for leveraging postal networks for offering a wide variety of climate services. And this is again, basically multipurpose infrastructure for climate action. Just to mention a few examples, uh, we have the generation of electricity from renewable sources, reselling that excess energy, uh, also making electric vehicle charging stations accessible, uh, offering new sources of funding for climate related projects, um, then also how they are acting as points of distribution for emergency supplies after natural disasters, uh, supporting and helping with the operation of early warning systems. And beyond that, in environmental services, they are uh, offering quite a few uh, services for enabling the transition towards circular economy, for example, through reverse logistics. Now, these are just mere um, examples which can illustrate how this wide variety of services are actually instrumental to give multiple uses to the infrastructure. Now, as I mentioned before, it means that countries do not have to build other infrastructure systems to deliver these essential services. So in a way, just the, uh, just the fact that these are being offered, it's a resource efficient and sustainable perspective of reusing postal networks. Now, uh, the next question is, why should, post, why should postal networks pursue this role as sustainable infrastructure? The first point that we would like to, to highlight here is that it already aligns with post climate goals. So in 2021, UPU members already gave the authority to UPU to establish this achievable worldwide goal to reduce carbon emissions. And this paved the way to the Congress resolution of 2023, in which you, as I mentioned before, you already have this voluntary global target, you have these uh, plans to build a UPU climate facility and all other key um, initiatives such as the transparency action. Beyond that, there are other opportunities that could be created for postal networks serving as sustainable infrastructure systems. Uh, first of all, it could attract government support. And this is essential because it could scale up some uh, sustainability projects. And this could come in a variety of ways. So this could be financial incentives, enabling policies, research partnerships, or in general, just aiding postal services in adopting cutting edge sustainable technologies and practices. Uh, also within posts, it can of course increase efficiency and cost reduction. And looking outside of posts, uh, an outward perspective, it could also offer climate services to other sectors. So as we have seen, uh, you have already a widespread variety of services, and this could add to that uh, same trend because it could diversify those services and generate new revenue streams. It could also uh, increase the visibility through collaboration and basically under a banner of sustainability, which will also be good for reputation purposes. Now, uh, I'm almost done, but there are a few elements that we have identified in terms of now that we know that this is something that could be valuable for the environmental community, the infrastructure community, and the postal community, what are the barriers? How can we make sure that this is achievable? 
And first of all, we need postal networks to gain visibility as allies for climate action. And also to see the significant advantages that it could bring to use their infrastructure systems for environmental strategies. Now, there is one hurdle on the level of awareness about the role of postal networks for sustainable infrastructure agendas. So this lack of awareness can also lead to missed opportunities and also for them not to be integrated into infrastructure planning and climate action strategies. Relatedly, there's also a limited collaboration between different expert communities. And this could be a, a significant barrier specifically between government agencies, infrastructure communities, environmental policymakers, and the postal sector itself. Another key barrier is how can we make sure that the variation in capacities between like different national and sectoral uh, players cannot limit the, the scalability and the, ability, and the ability to contribute to the sustainability agendas. And finally, one of the key barriers that I'm sure we all uh, know is the limited government funding, the lack of private sector interest or other financial constraints that could be limiting um, the full potential of postal networks to fully engage and to contribute to sustainability uh, strategies. Now to tackle these barriers, the report aims to propose certain strategies to address them. Now, before finalizing these recommendations, we are organizing these consultations to gather inputs by experts such as yourselves, uh, so that we gather uh, recommendations that are actionable and feasible in the short and medium term, uh, both for post environmental makers and also to actually achieve this global collaboration that we have uh, just mentioned before. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you very much. And Olivier, uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Anna, <clears throat> for an overview of, of this, this report, uh, which is still in the making. Um, so I would like now to, to open the floor for, for any questions uh, for Anna. Please, now it's the audience. So that doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> um, Okay, anyway, thanks a lot, um, but we will continue. Um, but first of all, uh, we will start with what I mentioned earlier with the two um, additional uh, presentations. And as I said, okay, th there is a question now in the chat and um, let me see, it's Christine and she would like to know when the report will be released. Uh, thank you for the question, Christine. Um, so we are finalizing the recommendations. We want to make sure that we have a, a, a good survey, let's say, of the different experts participating in, in the finalization of these recommendations. Uh, and therefore, once we finalize, we will uh, then share it. So we don't have a strict deadline for publication, but we are looking at sometime in the next quarter. Thank you very much. I hope that's clear. And I see another raised hand from Vietnam. Mr. Mrs. Hang, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, could you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Um, yes, perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oliver Kalisi. And thanks uh, for the comprehensive uh, presentations from Ms. Anna. Uh, we understand that uh, for the sustainable uh, this series is very important and urgent. And uh, I'm really interested with the um, idea that you just been presented that uh, the uh, poster services should offer climate services to other sectors. So I would like to uh, get more updates from you that how is the process have been done so far? And that is uh, from the UBU uh, unions or uh, from the member states uh, to implement the plan to offer the climate services to other sectors. Could you please share more with us? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. And I guess, I mean, this question is 
probably best answered by, by, by the UPU. Uh, Yashwan? Yeah, as a host, I was still searching the, 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 the hands up. <laughs> uh, many thanks for this question. Uh, so uh, regarding how to provide climate services, uh, you probably will hear two examples later on uh, from colleagues uh, from Gerald and from Argo. But on the UPU side, um, there are uh, three angles that we are tackling now. Uh, one is to uh, try to attract climate finance to support the business model development for the climate services. Uh, there are different areas that we're looking into. For instance, to what extent the post network can be anchored for the remote areas uh, for the access to renewable energy. Uh, this is uh, more or less, we have seen energy sharing cases uh, and also energy trading cases uh, happening in the remote areas. And actually uh, the facilities and the presence of post provide a good entry point. Uh, another area is relating to, for example, in terms of green transport system. And to what extent uh, post is uh, on top of green delivery solutions uh, can be also anchored for the smart city initiatives. Uh, we have already seen uh, countries in, in include such a role in their smart city uh, planning uh, as well. So I just give two quick uh, examples that, but this is like where we are looking into business model uh, so that the, the, the post can achieve achieve uh, service diversification through this process. And there are other two areas that you, uh, at the secretary level we are uh, advancing. One is relating to climate knowledge. And they are uh, issues relating to, um, as well as issue relating to access to technology. And in our recent consultations, despite an ambition, there are also questions, well, are there like a tailored uh, knowledge package and uh, technology solution for post to take those action and, and in, to equipped the infrastructure, including for some digital asset for the necessity of developing the climate services. Uh, and then the third area, of course, is the climate policy uh, engagement, including this uh, consultation uh, and also this re joint report with UNAP uh, colleagues. The idea is really to make uh, the action and voice uh, of the post network to be heard by the policymaker, not only at uh, our traditional uh, policy domain, but also importantly, uh, at the cross sector level, uh, cross government agency level, uh, for those one that deciding well uh, to put important uh, items on the agenda for climate action. And then to ask the question to what extent they have seen the potential of the post and see the post network as a strategic asset. So let me uh, also pause here uh, to see if you have any follow-up questions, uh, happy to answer immediately, but also happy to have email exchanges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yashwan. Do you want to follow up on, on what Yashwan just explained? Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I have very uh, general ideas of the, what uh, has been done by UBU and also in some uh, member countries. Thank you very much for the update. I, I have one more question is that uh, in the presentation, you mentioned about the climate services and environmental services. So could you please? Uh, explain to me what is the difference between these two kinds of services, climate and environmental services for postal networks, as I understand, is uh, for my uh, awareness is quite similar, so I don't could not uh, spread by this. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Um, Anna, do, do you want to answer the, this question? Yes, thank you, Oliver. Um, so it is true that it is difficult to distinguish in, in a way because climate services definitely fit under environmental services. Um, let me just um, make a disclaimer here that since we are focusing on the climate uh, action and how we can bring in uh, postal networks to actually provide those climate services. That's why we are making this distinction in the presentation and in the report. But in reality, climate services fall under environmental services uh, in a way. And then we are going to, uh, let me clarify as well, that environmental services 
could have a wider perspective. And so you might remember that in my presentation, I refer to some examples of uh, the transition to circular economies. And so, for example, that is one particular example that we can see different uh, national posts having uh, initiatives that are on leveraging the reverse value chain logistics so that maybe you capture the coffee pots and then you send it back to the producer. So that is one of a specific initiative that it's being uh, utilized in postal networks that is an environmental service and not necessarily connected with a climate service. I hope that clarifies, but let me know if you have further questions. Thanks, Anna. Um, Maybe I can also chip in one thing very quickly. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Oliver. And also, like, let me step in. Uh, to answer you also one thing is, uh, there is a whenever it is environmental related service, there's always potential that, of course, to note that environmental crises are uh, multi-factor, multi-faced, and also interrelated meaning that the issues relating to biodiversity, climate, and pollution uh, are usually like something like one action can potentially contribute to multiple areas of environmental issues. Uh, at the same time, um, in the current context, for example, um, for actions, especially in the post context, for actions like, for example, our fleets, our buildings, uh, that will have direct uh, energy use and also emission implication, uh, where we can build a direct link with the climate and that is important uh, to, to see say okay we could actually classify that into the climate services context uh, especially when we are helping our local community to take actions relating to their climate resilience issues uh, for example uh, one of these discussions that we're having, for example, with WMO is uh, whether the post network can be utilized for the uh, early warning system. Uh, that is uh, actually directly relating to climate resilience and also uh, climate adaptation issue and also disaster relief. Uh, it's a long answer to your like a short question is like environment issue can cover climate. Uh, but there are also sometimes uh, you see more direct link with the climate action. Then um, from communications perspective, it will help a post also put forward saying that falls into the category of climate services. Because when you fall, let the actions fall into that category, from the policy engagement perspective, it helps the government to see, oh, OK, this is a very clear connection with the climate uh, policy. Let's see what we can do. So that would also like sometimes the narrative helps. Uh, let me pause here as well. Thank you. Thanks, Yashwan. Uh, Mrs. Hang, do you want to follow up or is it now completely clear? Uh, thank you very much, the chair, Mr. Oliver, and thank you uh, a lot to two speakers. I have a little clearer uh, picture about some um, wonder in the presentation now. And uh, we just uh, very hopefully expect uh, for the UBU uh, guidelines of the cooperation uh, in the sustainable uh, uh, development uh, together with the, some guidelines from UBU uh, for the member countries to together implement uh, the sustainable, uh, sustainable plan, I'm sorry, the sustainable plan and goals in our post sectors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now, Margot, before before I let you <laughs> pose your questions, uh, James had his hands up very shortly uh, a while ago. James, do you want to add anything or is it really solved now? No, I think uh, Yashwan made the point okay. very well and uh, Anna as well. So okay. please continue. Yep, thanks, James. Okay, Mago, now, sorry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, thanks, Anna, for this um, uh, presentation of, of uh, the, the report and the, the transversal findings. Um, I had a question about, um, you mentioned the uh, C7 uh, to 2023 resolution from the, the UPU, and in particular, the fact that uh, UPU and actually the postal sector has set an emission reduction target of uh, eight. 
95% by uh, 2050. Uh, and here my question is um, whether, um, from your knowledge, uh, are we the only sector to have set uh, this type of uh, targets uh, globally as a sector? I'm saying that because this is sometimes what we say to promote a bit the uniqueness, let's say, of our sector. Uh, so do you have other examples of other sectors or do you think we are the, the only sector and can we say this? Um, th thanks, Margot. But um, unfortunately, you were right. Uh, it's only 85%, not 95%. We didn't dare to go that far. But okay, uh, Anna, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for the question, Margot. Um, there is definitely some evidence of other sectors that are piloting this type of um, initiatives and specifically a sectoral target. Um, I can point you to the airlines and the maritime um, sectors. They have similar targets. I would say that this one uh, for the postal sector is quite ambitious. So in a way, it is kind of setting an example that could actually um, inspire other sectors. So that is why it's so significant that the, the postal sector has actually agreed uh, on this target. Uh, and But there are other that are having similar discussions. Um, but of course, it's complicated when you have sectors in which the players are not so well communicated. Um, we have some good examples, uh, as I mentioned, for example, in the airlines and maritime, but there are other sectors that are not communicated at all, not coordinated. So in comparison to those, this is like a sea of difference. Uh, yeah, I hope that that can illustrate a little bit. Thank you. And uh, Jashwan or James, if you want to come in and compliment, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Anna, uh, Jashwan, do you want to add or anything or James or Susan? Yeah, I think Susan made a comment. Okay. I think Susan made a comment. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I just put in the uh, chat that it's the International Maritime Organization and the International Aviation, uh, Indiana, International Air Travel Association, I believe, uh, IATA, as we all know it. Um, but as Anna pointed out, they are less ambitious than the, uh, the UPU is to this point. Okay. Thanks, Susan. All right. If there are no further questions, we go to the uh, other two presentations. And uh, as I said earlier, we will start with uh, the example from Malaysia. So, uh, Jared, the floor is yours, please. Hi, Oliver. Uh, Hi. Can you hear me? Can you see? Yep. yep, perfectly fine. Okay. Just let me share my screen and then let me know if you can see the screen. Yeah, it's lights. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Well, it's it's it's, it's evening over here in Malaysia. Uh, I hope you all have a good day to start off with. Um, so today I'm just gonna share about uh a bit about uh post Malaysia uh or Malaysia Post. So basically, we're a postal co uh, company for Malaysia. And um, it's very much towards uh, our how we embark on our first and last mile uh, electrification journey. <clears throat> and truth to be told, if we were to compare with other uh, postal com uh, companies or postal operators uh, around the world, specifically um, uh, with the Euro European countries, um, I would say we are still far behind. But here today, I'm just going to be sharing much more about how we actually started and uh, some of the challenges, uh, some strides, and also some some struggles that we actually faced. So um, hopefully, some other uh, postal operators can can um, take into it and then see how best you can apply it to, into your own countries as well. So, but for Post Malaysia. 
Um, we always see sustainability as one of our key strategy in our transformation journey. Um, from, from how we see it is uh, we always consider the journey of a single parcel where it travels by land, sometimes by air, and then you go through all the cities and countryside to reach its destination. So, <clears throat> so this journey and when and, and when it's replicated hundreds and thousands of times daily, right? That's that's a lifeblood of post Malaysia. And when when you have replicated much more more enough times, that would actually consist of uh uh the carbon emission of that that we actually uh are to be accounted to 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 what we do on on a daily basis. <clears throat> So a bit of history of post Malaysia, we have been in uh we have, have been established uh, for more than two hundred years. So um it's the national postal company for for Malaysia, and currently we serve more than eleven million addresses throughout uh, a population of about thirty five million um uh, uh people across um Malaysia, and on the Yearly basis, we process about four hundred million mails and parcels. We have a fleet size of seven thousand four hundred of um, uh, of, of our fleet. It consists about five thousand uh two wheelers, which is bikes, and uh about two thousand um uh, uh vans. Or this is how you can see in the pictures. That's one of the types of vans that we actually use. In terms of number of post officers, we have about 600 over post, post, post officers with a workforce about close to 16,000. <clears> and when it comes to sustainability, um, we, 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 it's, it's always started off, I think for Post Malaysia, it started off with really knowing the reason behind why we're embarking sustainability. Uh, specifically for posts, uh, for for Malaysia, right? Um, I'm not sure about other countries, but for posts, uh, for for Malaysia, climate change has been quite apparent as well. We have been facing a lot of rains, floods, uh, across um the country, and that's that's where it comes to a big problem because um the transportation is second largest emission source in Malaysia. That accounts to close to thirty percent of um, the country's total emission. So, as we talk about delivery services, so each items that we deliver actually leaves trace on our planet or in our country. So, this this type of um effect is something that accountants these days can't put into the perspective to allow shareholders or to allow uh, uh, to allow stakeholders to look at it, and that's that's where sustainability practitioner has to actually create that kind of visibility to actually show that hey this is actually something that we 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 have been actually um creating in terms of a of an issue so for for us uh in our our ceo has always mentioned that um the logistics specifically post malaysia actually stands at the forefront of a monumental shift where Every package that we deliver can either contribute to a problem, problem, or uh, become part of a grand solution for sustainability. So that's why when he came on board uh, in 2022, late 2021, you know, that's that's where he started off having really creating, wanting to actually create a long-term uh, sustainability strategy. So when in 2023, we we made a commitment. And we have launched our sustainability roadmap committing to net zero by 2050. It's a very ambitious uh, uh, goal. At the time, we have no idea how we're going to achieve that. But we actually started off with having uh, a short term, uh, started, started off with really mapping what we have at the moment, what's, uh, what's our capability at the moment, and also what's the capability of, 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 of the market at the time. Because um, we know that at the time, just, just to give you an example, when we first started off um, our sustainability um, roadmap back in um, early last year, right? Uh, in terms of um, the 
the provider, the vendors that 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 has um I mean in terms of the number of models of the EV models, right? There are only two EV models available in the market at the time. But we we know that as as time progresses, you know, uh more and more um um models or options will be available, but we need to actually take take a first step as well. So last year we only have two models available in the market and fast forward at this point of time as we speak right we have almost 20 commercial uh, uh, um, options that we can actually choose from so so last year we started off with um we started off our journey so we have mapped out six distinct work streams uh delivery methods which is about electrification of our vehicles um at that time, uh, last year, all our vehicles, all seven thousand over vehicles, are uh, uh consists of uh petrol, or diesels. Only these two. Um, so we started off embarking on 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 the journey to really look at not purchasing or leasing any more petrol or diesel vehicles. Really, just going full electric or alternate uh, energy vehicles. So that's our first first work streams, and subsequently, uh, fleet optimization, which is finding ways to increase the efficiency of our vehicles. I will talk more about that later on. And um, green buildings, green buildings here. It's more on making sure that our uh, uh distribution centers, our logistics hubs, are as energy efficient efficient as possible. Uh, uh using um, green energy and also um, energy building energy management system through the use of softwares and also um, um, technology or IOT. Then subsequent, uh, the fourth one is waste management, where we are looking at managing our operational waste from its inception to its final disposal and ultimately creating a, a circular economy to be practiced by um, um, not just our employees but also creating that awareness to the public and that comes the fifth one which is eco-consumerism where it's about giving to consumers a choice of a service that is less harmful to the environment and finally it's about providing trainings that would um, ultimately future-proof our workforce so these six work streams are our fundament, uh, our foundation to our our path to net zero, and we have uh, we have established short term, medium term, and long term. Uh, the targets uh, shown here by twenty twenty five, uh, thirty percent emission reduction for scope one and two. 50% recycling rate, uh, rate of our operational waste and having all our products containing 80% renewable materials and also 50% training completed digitally. These are all our um, more like a short-term uh, goals and targets. And we have also have uh, by 2030, that's what, what we plan to achieve. And, and our ultimate goal is to go to uh, net zero by 2050. So today's presentation, I'm just going to be sharing about our first two um, um, uh, work streams, which is uh, delivery methods, which is on uh, greening our first and last mile vehicles, and also a bit of um, the technology behind our fleet that we have implemented. So what we have, we have uh, what, what I've shared just now is more on the, um, the 2025 target, which is creating a 28% fleet electrification and a longer term target, which is our midterm is, is, is having 100% of our last and first mile vehicles to be electrified by 2030. And this actually creates that impact to reduce our usage of our petrol and diesel because on on an annual basis, we actually use one uh, close to 1.2 million liters of petrol and about 4 million liters of diesel. And we have begun, um, so since we have started um, 
committing our our to net zero by 2050 in early last year we have begun rolling out uh, our electric vehicles uh both two wheelers and four wheelers yeah and this is very much not just um um environmental compliance but it's very it's it's more towards really creating a business case which which we can not just to save them to to protect the environment but also saving costs for us as well and a bit of fun fact for uh, for for malaysia right um the petrol price for Malaysia is actually one of the cheapest in in Asia, uh, except Brunei, but it's one of the cheapest in Malaysia. Uh, sorry, in Asia, and um, in fact, it's pretty much uh one of the top uh cheapest petrol around the world. It costs about um less than half a euro per liter. For the petrol, uh, but I'm gonna show you how how we can actually uh justify the cost of changing our petrol vehicles to um our EVs later on. But while we actually talk about changing our e um uh, changing our vehicles from the the uh petrol and di diesel to EVs, right? We are also facing the problem where uh we can't change all these vehicles overnight. And that's where the fleet optimization, the telematics come into place. Because uh, without technology, without data, we, we wouldn't be able to actually manage or really look, looking at how we can actually reduce the, the, the usage of our petrol and uh, diesel. So that actually goes hand in hand with um, um, our electrification process, where the vehicles, uh, more towards just um, an external thing. It's more like a skin, but the telematics is actually the heart of our operation. Because um, even if we change all our vehicles to electric, but if we do not change the way we drive it, our energy, energy which is either electric or um, petrol and diesels, you know, would still remain the same. And that's where we have to set ourselves um, an ambitious target of equipping our fleet with telematics or with, with, with telematics by 2030. So presently, about 26% of our vehicles are already equipped with telematics. And what, what we have done with, with, with this um, uh, data is that we are able to actually route optimize. We we uh through having the data, we maximize the pickup and drop off points and also improve the driving behavior. Uh, because through the telematics, we're able to actually identify whether drivers are accelerating harsh, uh, accelerating unnecessarily or braking harshly, um, or um leaving the vehicles idling. So all this, we're able to actually give them a score and ultimately uh, promoting a better driving behavior. Through that, we're able to save a lot of costs specifically on the idling time as well. Because uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, uh, um, Malaysia is a very hot country. So the uh, throughout the entire year, right, um, the weather is about 34, 35 degrees Celsius. So what drivers has been practicing all this while is that whenever they, um, they, they, they send a parcels or when they uh, disembark from the vehicles, they will usually keep the engine running just to make sure that uh, the AC is, is running. And then uh, by the time they come back, the vehicles will be comfortable. So uh, what, what we have noticed is that because of that idling, it actually uh, um, consume more about fifteen percent more uh, of of our fuel fuel consumption. That's why we have through the telematics we're able to actually reduce this idling time. And not just that, um, we're able to leverage data to an anticipate um and uh, anticipate schedule maintenance. Uh, uh, we're able to minimize downtime and um, standing the longevity of our fleet through predictive analytics, 
and um, we, we through that we're able to actually unlock um, a lot of um, operational efficiency and cost reduction where we can provide real-time data to help us op uh, optimize routes, um, um, uh, reduce fuel consumption, and minimize our carbon footprint, which is much uh, the, the most important. And through that, um, that's not only they're able to guide our drivers, uh, uh, most importantly, able to actually pave a way for uh, a much more smarter fleet management system for us. So a bit of our, our journey for, for our EV um, journey, right? We started off somewhere around last early last year, um, where I just shared just now at the time, we only have two models available early last year. So we started off with um, having proof of concepts with these two models, making sure that uh, whether, um, um, whether it's really fit for our operations, because previously all our our bikes, right? Uh, petrol, you know, um, the readiness of the of the the models might not be there because uh, uh the usage of a commercial bikes, uh, compared to um to a normal uh users, right? It's very very different because we are carrying a lot of loads. We're carrying parcels. We're carrying letters. Things like this. Um, the box behind, um, on on a good day might you a, a postman might need to carry additional probably uh twenty uh twenty to forty kgs of um uh, of of um goods behind of of parcels behind so that actually will 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 um will will not not sure whether the bikes uh might be able to actually uh deliver as how it's supposed to be so the first part of last last year was about really testing it and then ultimately we found that uh through a bit of um uh, modification we're able to uh, uh um make sure that it's fit for purpose so we flag off our first first uh 20 bytes and subsequently we have uh uh a batches of these these bytes and fans uh rolling out throughout the year and where we are at the moment is that we have uh, 55 locations uh, across Malaysia where we have already deployed uh, our uh, vans, electric vans and also electric bikes. <clears throat> um, a, to a total of about 160 bikes has been uh, deployed and also 143 vans. And through the this telematics as well, we're able to calculate uh, the clean kilometers that have been clocked for um these these three hundred EVs uh and to date we we have we have run this by uh these these bikes and vans for close to a million plus kilometers um so far of course there there are have lot uh there are challenges that we have faced but um these uh, these challenges um so far has been addressed. In, in a very methodical way and um uh that's why that's why the management um have have seen the economic benefits of it uh and and um the feedback from the postman has been very 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 positive so uh this year we'll be adding additional 1200 uh uh electric bikes and also additional 350 fans uh into our fleet and uh, currently, we are the largest EV fleet operator in Malaysia. And these are some of the pictures that we, we, have, we have taken when we first rolled out um, our EVs. Um, it, it's very important to uh, really educate our postman on how um, this EV works because um, uh, truth to be told, pop, um, these these vehicles are probably the first time they have uh they have they actually used um uh EVs. So the driving dynamics are very, very different compared to the usual vehicles that they have dri uh, uh, driven. So a lot of trainings that we have to actually uh do for 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 them. 
So, uh, Ter the Ter Ter sorry for, for interrupting, but yeah. but we're running out of time. Um, right. Okay. Okay. Just just the last slide. Then we were over. last ten minutes, and now we are yeah. at twenty. So, if you could hurry up a little bit, that would yeah. Be okay. Nice. So, I I I think I think um. One of the key messages here is that um, for, for post in Malaysia, well, we always look at three things, uh, or we always see it as three Cs. First is uh, the cost, and um, which is a, the first C, and then the capability of our organization, whether the organization is ready, um, whether um, in terms of financial, are they ready? In terms of um, the capability, are they ready? And then the capability of market. If these three Cs doesn't really meet uh, where we are, so it, it will be very tough for us to actually go, go for it. But um, based on our first year, we have, or we have we have found out that there are a lot of advantage um, and opportunities. Fuel uh, and energy savings probably is about less. Um, we we save almost 50% of our, our our operating costs purely because of uh, uh, just, just by switching to EVs. Our repair and maintenance has, has been uh close to uh we have we have reduced almost 70% as well because um the parts um it is it's the parts of the vehicles are much more lesser, you know. And then uh finally there's there's really there's there's no uh tailpipe emission for us. And bringing that, you know, we actually have, have used that to um create business opportunities for us as well, allowing sales team to actually uh, share these informations to our customers and we're able to actually work with a lot of uh, corporate customers uh, that that would want us to be as um, we want us because we are uh, one of the uh, few um, delivery partners that has uh, EV solutions yeah and to end this is really looking at what's next for us because we understand that if you're looking at the scope one, scope two, and scope three uh, value chain, right? We are part of our uh, scope three for customers. And we, we we aim to actually use this as a way to actually unlock the value and really giving value to our customers as well. Because if we're able to actually reduce our own emissions, ultimately we're able to actually put um, uh, provide a much more uh, cleaner delivery service to our customers as well. Yeah. And then that sums up my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. And I see in the chat, there are a lot of questions. Um, but before we go through them, probably you said it, but, but maybe I missed it. Uh, the, the the electricity where does it come from do you generate it in, in yourselves via solar panels or how do you so currently we have uh solar panels in uh three of our um biggest distribution centers that accounts for about 20% of our uh electric uh electricity yeah that's that's um our solar panels the rest is still from the grid so there are a few ways in Malaysia to, uh, I'm not sure about other countries, but in Malaysia, there are a few ways of doing it. Either you actually have a virtual power purchase agreement that actually you purchase uh, with, with um, a solar farm far away from us, but it will still fit into the grid. Or um, you were able, to, or, or you would just purchase a, uh, uh, they call it renewable energy certificates from from um, the utility provider, but so far, uh, twenty percent of our electricity is from 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 renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So then the the, the first question was uh, from Margot. Uh, you mentioned the thirty percent emission reduction target by twenty twenty five, and to what year do you compare this this reduction? Our baseline is twenty twenty one. 21. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the next one, it's four questions <laughs> in, in one. Um, uh, how does the national plan to call other sectors to join or do you have in, in Malaysia a national plan uh, which also asks other sectors to, to reduce their, their emissions? 
I think uh, for Malaysia, um, the government do have their own plans as well, sustainability plans. But from our experience, just to share is that also um, the government are actually looking at corporates players to be working towards that as well. Um, they, uh, their view is that uh, corporates players, like, like, like especially on the poster uh, operators, must be independent enough to actually stand up and re really create change. So what we have done is that we we uh previously uh there were no government support really so actually we did it through our own self we wanted to actually make change and once we have done this for the first year right then government actually noticed the changes and that's where they actually came and said oh okay this is a very good idea we can actually uh use you as an example to uh um uh, share with other sectors you know. And that's that's where we actually uh have more visibility in terms of the branding for us as well. And uh we are able to actually give our views as well because they themselves, uh I would say government also, they have a commitment as well. It, then they will start to ask, okay, uh, we have that commitment. So corporate players, uh how what's what's your opinion if we want to actually come up with some green green policies? And I feel like at that time, that's, that's where we can actually contribute our views and probably lobby to, to be beneficial to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, and uh, also from, from Mrs. Hung, it's uh, how to mobilize investment. Um, uh, well, well, I think for EVs, it's, it's important to uh, have a team together to really create uh, the total cost of investment from for for EVs versus your current fleet, you know, and um, uh, you can either purchase it or or you can actually lease it, you know, it 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 depends. We for us we create a lot of scenarios, you know, to buy or not to buy, or 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 and or or to do nothing at all. Can we can we continue using our own fleet, you know, and and what's what's the cost uh that we incur in things like this? Yep. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. But but that means you you didn't get any investments from from your government, for example. So you no. really were on your own. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then the last question would be. From... But just to share a bit as well. Uh, yep. After what we have done for the the first year, what we have did it on, on on our own, and that's where the banks are very interested. The banks have their own sustainability agenda as well. Then they they came and approached us. Because we mm -hmm. have done that, you know, they were say, oh, uh, we can give you a lot of uh, green financing as well. Would you interested, you know, because, uh, and then really after that, a lot of, a lot of incentives came to, to knocking on our door. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds really good. And the last question from Mrs. Hung is how to assess the rate of uh, emission reductions? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with, uh, how do you measure it? Well, first we have to create a baseline, uh, and 2021 numbers is our baseline. Yeah. Okay. Um, then James said uh, it's a wonderful example of the value of fleet anal analytics. And in this regard, uh, Bliede from, from Postenel um, from the Netherlands asked or said that there are quite some, some uh, limits on the use of telematics uh, due to worker rights and privacy. Uh, did you encounter any such limitations? Uh, thankfully, no. Uh, I mean, I mean the, the security is 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 in terms of this data has been uh, the IT security is there. But in terms of the workers' rights, uh, so we have always shared with them beforehand to say that hey, this is this is uh, this this vehicles has the ability to track uh how you drive and whatnot, you know, and ultimately. If you're able to have a good score, we will actually reward you in in in, in some form, you know, because we we create a bit of like a competition to actually um uh find out who is the best driver in for that month. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's quite interesting, and also in regard to the telematics, um, you showed that that um, uh, carriers were leaving the vehicle, uh, running um. Uh, to, to, to keep cool. Uh, now that you have um, them shut off the, the air conditioning, are there any additional issues with heat-related illnesses in the carrier? Oh, okay. 
we well uh I don't think so because we only ask them to shut off the vehicles when they are not inside the vehicles. But when they're back, they can actually just switch it on and they they, they will still switch on the AC. They, yep. We're just trying to make sure that they don't keep the car idling. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Question, I hope this, this answers your questions. Now, next question. Um, with the plan of 100% fleet electrification by 2030, do you have targeted industry organizations that you could leverage the charging infrastructure for additional revenue? Mm, interesting. Currently, we don't have this, uh, but um, this is probably something that we can actually leverage in the future. But for what we are facing at the moment is not to provide charging infrastructure for the public. The issue is we do not have enough power coming in to actually support this as, as, as we keep growing. So we we would have, uh, based on my calculation, we would face this, uh, they call it power issues by the third year or probably next year when we mm -hmm. continue to roll out more, more vehicles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So no more questions for you for the time being. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. At least, and so, and then with that, I would give the floor to Margot for her presentation. Thanks, Oliver. Thank, Thank you. Actually, Margot had uh, earlier shared. Uh, her video, uh, her presentation in a video form, and Mago is here. Mm -hmm. So let me, I have shared my screen, let me play the video. Uh, yep. And please pause me if uh, you don't see anything. Yep, will do. Uh, I see Mago talking, but I cannot hear anything. Yes, there is no sound. Uh, Okay, just a moment. No, still no sound. Was that, uh, unfortunately, the Mago uh, can you actually do uh, the on-site uh, presentation? Is it possible to do it? Yes, I mean, the idea was to, uh, yeah. to have you <laughs> show the video, but well. Uh, so. Um, doesn't go to, oh, here it is. Okay. So I will do that live then. Uh, so I would like <laughs> indeed to thank the UPU and the uh, UNEP for the uh, elaboration of the case study on La Post and for the opportunity to share with you this case study today. Uh, so my objective is to present to you how the postal sector can be an infrastructure to develop a circular economy. And I'm very pleased to present you that on behalf of La Poste. So first of all, uh, I think it's important to underline that in France, there has been uh, a really enabling regular regulatory context as regards the development of circular economy. Uh, the first step was the issue by the French government in 2018 of a circular economy roadmap. This roadmap had uh, 50 measures and aimed to achieve 100% of circular economy. Uh, it had four priorities, which I believe are particularly relevant uh, for the postal sector in terms of better production, better consumption, uh, having a better waste management, and also engaging all stakeholders. 
Um, this roadmap uh, aimed to be um, implemented through different legislative initiatives. One of the most important legislative initiatives was the 2020 2020 anti-waste law, uh, which really aimed to transform the French economy from a linear model into a circular model of economy. Uh, one of the main objectives of this law was in particular uh, the removal of the use of single plastic. So that was one of the main objectives. Other objectives were in particular to uh, better inform consumers, to fight against waste, but also to fight against uh, planned obsolescence. So that's about the French context. If you take the EU-wide context, so the European Union context, uh, I wanted to mention here the regulation on waste and packaging waste, which has set important uh, objectives uh, for the member states in the European Union to reduce their packaging. Also, it has set objectives in terms of uh, single-use uh, plastic packaging. And uh, this regulation is particularly uh, impactful for postal companies because it's the first time that e-commerce uh, waste, uh, packaging waste, is mentioned in an EU regulation for specific, uh, with specific targets. So I said particularly of relevance to the postal operators. So this is about the regulatory context. And uh, also, the context of our company, La Poste, has been particularly enabling for the development of circular economy. Uh, the reason why is that sustainability is really at the earth of La Poste uh, strategy. Uh, we are what we call a mission-driven company. This means that besides making only profit, which is the objective of any company, we consider that we also have a bigger role to impact posit positively the society and to try to make the world a better place. Um, also, if you consider our strategic plan, which is called La Post 2030 Committed to You, you can see that among the seven priorities of our strategic plan, six of them are directly related to sustainability. So here again, the company context of La Poste has been particularly enabling for the development of sustainability and more precisely for circular economy. So if I focus now on circular economy, what I would like first to, to uh, explain to you is how we apply circular economy principles to our own operations. We have really placed a focus on the responsible use and management of our resources, and this is the case at all levels of the organization. For that purpose, we have set ambitious goals. Uh, in particular, we have set the ambition uh, to reuse or recycle 75% of the waste that we are producing. Uh, we also have set uh, the objective to uh, use for another purpose 100% of our reusable IT equipment. Uh, last objective is that we have set the objective to integrate 50% of recyclable material by 2025. Uh, also important is that we want to enhance the lifespan of our equipment. So it means that we are using uh, spare parts of our uh, sorting machines in order to repair other machines. Uh, another interesting initiative is that we have created an internal marketplace which aims at the reuse of the equipment that we have in the different uh, sorting centers. So this was created at the uh, initiative of our uh, one of our employees. And I said, it's really uh, a marketplace where people can say, okay, I want to give away this equipment. Others can say, I want to get uh, that equipment. So it's really uh, a good example of circular economy. Also, uh, we support solidarity initiatives with a focus on the reuse of resources. And as a result, we have uh, more than uh, 30,000 computers, uh, cell phones and tablets, which were given away for reuse outside of the group in 2022. So really this idea to be able to use, uh, reuse our own uh, IT equipment uh, externally. Another important issue 
that we have really been uh, focusing on is how to better produce uh, packaging. So this is about our eco-design policy of packaging. We have set here two main objectives, which is the reduction of the material that we are using for each packaging, and also the integration of more recycled material into our packaging. As a result, in 2021, the recycled material uh, that we were selling represented 40% of the total packaging uh, sold by La Poste. And we have set even uh, important, more important objectives for 2025 and 2030. Uh, also to mention that all the packaging that we are selling in La Poste is uh, fully recyclable. So really a big focus uh, on uh, the eco design of our packaging. As regard um, another uh, important element for packaging is uh, to be able to have more reusable packaging. Uh, why do we do that? Because we see from a questionnaire that 54% of consumers would like the websites to use more reusable packaging. So really, this is a big trend among the customers. So that's why we have developed uh, in La Poste uh, packaging which is uh, dual use. So all our plastic parcel packaging is dual use and we also have several uh, types of cardboards which are dual use. So dual use means it can be used two times. Uh, but we also want to go further than only dual use. We want to have packaging that can be reused a much higher number of times. Uh, so that's about the packaging we are selling. But it's also important to mention, and you, we all know that uh, as postal operators, that uh, there is even a much larger percentage of parcels and packaging that we are transporting uh, as a postal company. So really, uh, one of our main uh, focus is to uh, collaborate closely with our customers on how to optimize their packaging. And for that purpose, we have developed a label which is called repost. So actually the producers of packaging can get this uh, repost label if they meet up to 40 verification points, which are both technical and CSR verification posts. So that's a label which is in a packaging which says uh, this um, uh, packaging can be uh, reused and uh, can also get uh, into the logistics uh, of La Poste, into the, the different uh, processes internally, uh, but also meet specific uh, CSR uh, criteria. As regards uh, reusable packaging, uh, I think uh, an important thing is also that we have set the objective to change uh, the customer behavior. This is something that Anna was referring to, that uh, as a big uh, logistic provider of packaging, we really have the means to change uh, the customer habits. And for that purpose, uh, we have uh, developed a partnership with a startup which is called Hipley. Uh, I believe this is also the case for some other European postal operators. And Hipley actually has a packaging which can be used, uh, reused 100 times. Basically, how it works. Uh, the way it works is that you ship your order uh, and you ask for it to be shipped into a reusable parcel. Then when as a customer, you receive your package, you have three choices. You can either send uh, the parcel empty uh, back to Ipli. You can, second choice, you can reuse it. Or third choice, you can send back the packaging empty to the retail company. And it's important to mention that uh, for all this uh, logistics, La Poste is uh, the partner uh, in charge of that for Ipli. As you can see there, for instance, you can put your parcel, empty parcel into um, a, a post office box uh, in the street. Uh, so uh, the success of Ipli is very big. There are more than uh, 350 customers uh, from all sectors which are using uh, Hipley uh, in France. So it's big, like big uh, e-retailer companies, uh, like uh, um, well-known brands like Clarence, for instance. So it's really a success. And as a result, there are up to uh, 30 
uh, and even 40,000 of EPLI packaging, which are used in France every day. Um, so let me now move to why Postal Network is really um, the logistic enabler for circular economy. This is based on three uh, main assets of uh, our industry and our infrastructure. First of all, uh, we are really a, a network which is affordable from an economic perspective. And this is very important given the value difference between uh, the second and objects compared to the new products. Second asset is that we have a network which is accessible to all citizens all over the territory. So it makes secondhand products accessible uh, to any type of person, uh, anywhere he or she may live. Uh, the third asset we have, and this was actually the presentation from Malaysia Post, is uh, that we have one of the largest fleets of electric vehicles. So really, our network is performant from an environmental perspective. Uh, so really, uh, we have uh, very big assets to become the logistic enabler for circular economy. And this is also linked to our responsibility of universal service provider. So uh, I would like to finish by saying that indeed, uh, Postal Network has a key role in uh, circular economy. We have a key role in reverse logistics first, as it was also mentioned by Anna. Uh, if you take the example of La Poste, we have created two subsidiaries which are in charge of the collection and the recycling of office waste. The first one is Recigo, so it's in charge of all the logistics, so the collection of waste in the offices. And the second one is uh, Nouvelle Attitude, who is in charge of the sorting and the recycling of this office waste. Uh, secondly, uh, we have, uh, in terms of reverse logistics, uh, a role to facilitate the returns of goods in particular, the e-commerce uh, goods. And this is done through our parcel locker uh, network, which are the, called the, the pickup points, or also through our letterboxes. Uh, second, uh, th sorry, last example is about uh, a pilot that we have created for the return of credit cards within uh, the post offices. And as it was mentioned, um, this is something we can do because we are a trusted uh, third party for the citizens. Um, so besides that, we really are the key partner for the selling of secondhand products on big platforms. Uh, big flat platforms that we all know like uh, Vinted, uh, like back market, they are really using the postal network as the main logistic provider for the enabler of circular economy. Uh, so uh, to finish, my main message is that really there is an opportunity for postal operators into circular economy, not only because we definitely have a role to enhance uh, sustainable development, but also because circular economy is a real lever uh, for new revenues. It's a lever to enable diversification and it's a lever to make uh, also uh, more uh, revenues out of uh, circular economy. So thanks for the opportunity again to present and if there is still time, I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Mago. Um, there is one question uh, in, the, in the chat for you uh, regarding Hipley. Uh, do you have a life cycle assessment for the number of circles a packaging makes before it disappears? Yeah, <laughs> so that's uh, one of the most tricky questions as regards uh, reusable packaging. And we are all facing that issue. Uh, so from what we, we see, uh, packaging, reusable packaging is uh, reused about six to seven times. So it's very far from the 100% times that uh, a packaging like Hipley uh, can be uh, reused. Uh, so that's why there are different uh, incentives uh, that uh, have been put in place so that uh, the uh, customers have more incentives to reuse the packaging. Like for instance, there can be a small amount on, of money that they are given back if they would uh, send the Hipley uh, packaging in, uh, empty. 
Um, also, we are trying, as I was saying, to use uh, the really wide network of uh, mail letterboxes, uh, of mailboxes that we have uh, all of our friends. But definitely, uh, I mean, uh, the, the packaging is not reused 100 times. Uh, it's reused uh, less than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And another question uh, was, uh, do you service the, the winted lockers? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> I, I, I would have to, to double check that because I know in France uh, that uh, the parcel lockers of Vitted have really developed very far, uh, very quickly uh, during the, the last months. So really we are seeing them spreading up <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. a bit uh, everywhere. Uh, but I, I would need to double check if it's La Poste who is uh, providing these parcel lockers or if it's uh, a, another uh, provider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So I don't see any other question in, in, in the chat now. And the, the thing is, our meeting actually is over. So, but, but Yashwan um, wanted to, 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 to make a, a survey, a live survey actually, actually with you. She put it now in the chat as well. So I don't know. Yashwan, how you want to proceed? Shall we try to go through the questions right now or? Okay, I see. Uh, thank you, uh, Oliver. Uh, I put a link so uh, colleagues, you can feel free to fill it because as Oliver mentioned, the time is over. So I don't intend to put everyone like waiting to go through another like 10, 15 minutes of the survey. Uh, is part of the consultation process. So your response opinion matters for generating the recommendation. I think earlier there was one question regarding the publication plans and which also answered by Anna. And to actually provide further details is uh, after this webinar, we will have a, also a consultation with a different audience for this report. So currently this uh, survey mainly targeting on uh, uh, design operators and also post entities. Uh, and then uh, in another round of consultations, which will be primarily focused on environment policy makers. Uh, having said that, we will use multiple ways of getting uh, inputs and opinions. Uh, you will be providing updates uh, in, for example, in the SBSG context uh, as well uh, for this uh, publication plan of the report. Uh, have it, and, and that's all for me on the logistical part, but uh, for any like, last minute comments from colleagues and also from uh, the presenters, uh, it's over to you, uh, Oliver. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So if there are any further comments, questions, uh, please feel free uh, to use this opportunity right now. So, Anna, please. Thank you, Oliver. And just very quickly, because I know that maybe colleagues have other commitments, uh, I just wanted to thank Margot and Jared once again for presenting the case studies and to uh, mention to other participants that these case studies are also part of the collaboration between UPU and UNEP, as Margot mentioned, uh, because they are excellent examples of how a sustainable infrastructure can be leveraged. And as you might have heard from both of them, the initiatives that they are piloting that they have been implementing for quite a while now are aligned with national priorities. So in a way, they are already contributing to climate targets at the national level. And this is exactly what we are advocating in this report, because it's basically saying, how can we green that infrastructure? And then again, how can we bring other uh, services so that the infrastructure that is already present in postal networks can be leveraged to bring other climate services, other environmental services, and uh, all in all pursue uh, sustainability. So I just wanted to, to highlight that point and thank again, uh, Margot and Jared. Uh, thank you. And I just saw that uh, Mr. And Mrs. Moziki raised his, her hand. Um, do you want to? I have the floor. Please, Botswana. Um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much for, for this awesome session. Um, our question really is, even as different countries are looking into 
working out the the climate action plans and how they are going to align with their local national plans, um, as well as being guided by the UPU and um, Yeshua's team, for example. Is there consideration for perhaps on a biannual basis, the sustainability team from across the postal services meeting like this? Because this session was awesome. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. And I guess I also uh, uh, give the floor for this question to, to Yashwan or James or Susan. Yeah, I think it's better Susan to answer this. Susan is managing the program and then she is in better position to talk about the program's schedule. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, so now I'm on the spot and I can't pass it to anybody. Um, <laughs> Hi everybody, it's uh, it's good to see you all today. Um, I think that we would like very much to have more uh, uh, webinars like this and we appreciate uh, your feedback. Thank you so much uh, from Botswana for that. And um, uh, yes, we will try to come up with a regular schedule because I do believe that it is worth it. And it is also something that, uh, that we can do. Uh, and perhaps it'll be something, Oliver, that we could also run through the SPSG uh, in terms of organizing and and uh, coming up with the the best way to to go forward, but um, I'm 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 really pleased, and and we would we would like to follow up definitely. Yeah, no, we, we can do this, of course, and and from what I saw from 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 this one and a half hours, and we are above uh, our time limit actually. So there is an interest in in this. This is highly appreciated. So yeah. We should definitely think about expanding this. All right. Nevertheless, this this brings us to, to the end. And so I want to, to also thank uh, Jared and, and Margot, but also Anna, of course, for co-hosting this, this, this session. And um, thanks for your interest. Uh, very good questions, very interesting answers. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that brings me to the end, and I hope to see you all soon once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. All. you. Thank you very Thank much. Bye-bye.